Welcome to California Now, a podcast produced by Visit California. I'm Satirius Johnson. This episode is all about how to hack Los Angeles. It's part two of our series on places you may not know, but really should check out in California's urban centers. We start with celebrity chef Jet Tila, a Food Network regular who tells us about the history of Thai Town, along with his favorite spots in the area. The hack, and here's the trick, if you know you're going to be eating like crazy in Thai Town or through LA, drive by staff on the way home and get some jade noodles to go, and then that'll be your dinner or your meal the next day, because that's the key move right there. And Mary Ford Joan, who writes the newsletter The Wild for the LA Times, tells us about amazing outdoor spots even many locals don't know about. So you can hike up at night, and the most wonderful thing is you are standing a couple thousand feet above LA and you are looking out at this just amazing lighted up megalopolis and it is breathtaking. After that, Zach Brooks of Smorgasburg LA shares secrets for trying an incredible variety of tasty food all in one place. That's all coming up on California Now. If you want to get to know part of a big place like Los Angeles, there's no better hack than to ask a local. It especially helps if the local in question happens to be Chef Jet Tila, who's known for appearances on such shows as Iron Chef America, The Best Thing I Ever Ate, and Guy's Grocery Games. He's here to tell us about the history of Thai Town in Los Angeles and a few of his favorite spots in the area. Welcome to California Now, Jet. Hey, Satiris, what's going on, man? Thanks for having me. A uh, true pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming on. So, you know, I wanted to start out, you know, for people who don't know Los Angeles, where is Thai Town and how was it established? Yeah, so uh, geographically, uh, Thai Town is, uh, some would say in Hollywood, adjacent to Hollywood. Uh, let me drill it down. It is uh, Hollywood Boulevard. Um, on the west, uh, it is um, flanked by Western Avenue. And on the east, it's Normandy Avenue. So I would say it's six blocks we're, 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 we're right attached to uh, Little Armenia. We're a little bit north of um, Koreatown. Uh, it is a, is it a really cool area. Some people even call it like uh, East Hollywood now. Mm, so it sounds like it's kind of fa like fairly central. Uh, you, it's not too hard to get to. No, not at all. Uh, the, the problem is you can drive by and not know you were in Thai town. So, I mean, <laughs> that's why I'm really excited that, you know, we're going to put a little spotlight. And you were asking about how it was formed. I mean, the really short story is, you know, L.A. houses the uh, largest population of Thai people outside of Thailand. That started in about 1966 when the first um, kind of large wave of Thais immigrated. My parents just happened to be in that wave. Uh, they did not know each other at that point. Um, and then through this this small group of Thais actually started Thai food, kind of the love for Thai culture in America um, about 50 years ago. So it was really exciting kind of being able to watch it all start. Thai Town was officially recognized in 1999. So, you know, before 1999 and this big sign and this beautiful little pagoda. Um, it was it was just a place where you could find the best Thai food, not just in L.A., but also in the U.S. Mm. So, I, I mean, a lot of these neighborhoods, you know, they, they start out with kind of like, you know, one, you know, outpost, <laughs> like maybe it's like a, a grocery store or, you know, a place of worship or something. And then it kind of kind of grows around that. I mean, did that was that the story of, of Thai Town as well? Yeah, I mean, real simply, you know, Silver Lake before kind of becoming hipster um, in the 60s was kind of a rough area. Uh, so it was very inexpensive. So um, the ties would would cluster in Silver Lake. And, you know, my dad tells a lot of stories of, you know, typical Im immigrant community, you know, like a one or two bedroom flat would house five or <laughs> up to 15 people. And, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, one apartment became three, became 10. And, and pretty soon we took over kind of a block. And that's kind of Thai town. And, you know, it was very villagey in that, you know, like, so if Satirius was coming uh, next week, we knew you were coming, we'd ask you to bring the case of coconut milk. And then if John was coming, bring a case of, of, of fish sauce. And that's right. exactly how the Bangkok market started. It wasn't a grocery store. It was literally a trading post, a place to uh, meet, a place to hang out and find fellow Thai people. Wow, that's really great. So, so like, so today, you know, what makes Thai Town such a special destination for people? 
Well, you know, I think, you know, food is probably the, the, the least political and the most kind of romantic way to, to introduce yourself to a culture. Um, but it's a, it's a place where you're going to be able to get authentic regional Thai food. You're going to be able to see even on Sunday mornings uh, right there in front of the Silom market, they still do an alms bowl. So most of us Thais are Theravada Buddhist. And um, around sunrise, you'll see a procession of, uh, of monks you know, get their their meal for the day. They'll line up and, and Thai citizens or non-Thais will actually put food in their little alms bowl and that's going to be their meal for the day. It's going to be a place you can get Thai massage, Thai music. You can find uh, periodicals that are probably, you know, 18 hours old because they get right on an airplane. Yes, there still are newspapers and magazines, by the way. You've actually been called the honorary mayor of Thai Town, um, and you've been appointed uh, to, you know, to be the Thai culinary ambassador to the United States by the Royal Thai government. What do those t- titles mean to you? Oh, man. Uh, um, you know what? I, I credit uh, Tony Bourdain, Anthony Bourdain, because um, way before the official title, you know, I walked him through Thai Town and, and we ate and we, uh, you know, uh, had a good time. And he was the one who actually said I was the honorary mayor of Thai Town. Uh, so what that means to me is, you know, um, someone who I looked up to my entire life, kind of anointing me and uh, being able to hang out with it for a day and, and really show my culture. So that really it was very impactful, um, made me feel really proud of, of not just being Thai, but also being Thai American and the, the rich history of, of kind of, the, of of our culture here. And then, you know, years later, the consul, consul general um, uh, in L.A. Uh, asked if I would, you know, officially be the Thai culinary ambassador. Um, and, you know, what are you going to say? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I wanted to ask you about, you know, your experience with Anthony Bourdain when you took him around Thai Town for that episode of uh, No Reservations. What was that experience like? Man, um, we're going to deep dive for, for a minute because any of us um, that are not just Angelinos, but are, are food followers, um, uh, you know, I don't think the story's ever gotten out of how that hooked up. And, and I think it's time. So cheers. I think we're going to yeah. let's lay it down. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I got a call from um, Tony and he was like, I, I, need to, I need to do this Thai Town tour with you. I've heard about Thai Town. This is really early. This is like 2006. Um, and he wanted, again, I was doing unofficial tours for a lot of kind of, you know, VIPs and industry people and kind of local government people of just walking through and giving them the kind of the culture that w- we're talking about now. And so Tony and I met up at the the old Bangkok market, my family store. Um, it was the first Thai grocery store in, in America, started in 1972. And we just basically walked around and talked about ingredients. But deeper than that, I think we were talking about the, the history um, of Thai food and Thai culture. Uh, then we drove him up uh, to Thai Town, and um, I took him. We, we, you know, I just walked him around the streets to kind of really feel the culture. And, and and you know, when you see, you know, fifty or hundred people, you know, kind of doing their morning routine, um, you really kind of get immersed in, in kind of their day to day. And then we, we 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 took him to the dessert shop. It was pretty amazing. But the the way the re, the way it all came to be was it was actually through Jonathan Gold. And I and if you're listening to this and you don't know who Jonathan Gold was, I I mean he was a he was a, a Pulitzer um winning food writer. Uh and you know and and he really was the voice of I think LA cuisine for so many years. And right. Um and he really loved a deep dive in these in these little kind of restaurants and and cultures and and avenues that uh that were kind of less explored so tony gave jonathan gold a call and jonathan gold was like look i can talk on thai food and i you know but you really want the guy and you really want the kid who grew up in it and really knows it well and that's how we connected so jonathan gold actually refused to take tony on the titan tour <laughs> said jet dealer had to take him and that's and, and i don't think a lot of people know that Oh, that's amazing. Wow. You got, you guys got connected by Jonathan Gold. What an amazing story. Wow. Yeah. It's like double anointed, by the way, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, I mean, just the being able to bring Anthony Bourdain around, I mean, that must've been an amazing day. Um, You know, the memories are happy and they're sad and they're bittersweet all at the same time. Through food, he really kind of just knew the right buttons to push and the levers to pull to kind of 
to, to, to really tell stories. And I think that was really the magic. I mean, he really dedicated an entire episode of, of no reservations to our great city. And, and part of that story was, was, was our story of the, of Thai people. Mm. You know, I'd, I'd really, I'd really love to hear about some of your favorite stops during filming, you know, including like, you know, the sights and the sounds and the smells that you brought him to experience. Oh, for sure. So, you know, as a grocery store kid, of course, we started at the at the Bangkok market. It's not there anymore. We, uh, my family actually, after 50 years, closed the uh, the store. Um, so we started at the Bangkok market. And then uh, yeah, if you when when you go, not if when you go to Thai town, um, you do want to kind of walk that strip um, that 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 Silo market. It's Silo market. And it's kind of right in the middle. Um, there and next to there, there, there's a, there's Hollywood Plaza in Hollywood Plaza. There are about five restaurants, um, one dessert shop, uh, and, and within there, I want you to eat at Rune Pear, Rune Pear, mm. which, which has the best Thai papaya salad in America. I know I'm going to mm. get into lots of fights, fights over this because <laughs> every other restaurant that serves papaya salad is going to try to come after me. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we have, and then I want you to eat the, uh, the 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 pork jerky there, which is kind of marinated in air dried pork, um, and then deep fried uh, mm. with a bit of sticky rice and papaya salad. That's kind of am- amazing. Um, and then I want you to hit the dessert shop. Uh, it, it's called Ban Kanom Thai, and translation is House of Thai Desserts. And um, they they do confections daily. They're making them right in front of you, and they also import um, some of the best collection of Thai fruits and and sweets ever. Like it's one of the few places you're going to get Thai durian and mangosteens and jackfruits directly from Thailand. Um, and and there's a thousand other, well, well literally probably a hundred other restaurants you could eat at. But we took Tony to Sap, um, Sap Cafe, which is about a block east from that. Uh, that Hollywood Plaza location and it's called a coffee shop but it's not in the kind of spirit of uh, a western coffee shop coffee shops Mm -hmm. in Thailand are places you can get one plate meals or one bowl dishes meaning if you're kind of coming going from here to there or in your day it's not a multi-course experience but some of the best boat noodles um, ever and and boat noodles are basically a five-spice bone broth um rice noodle dish uh that you that would usually serve in the floating markets of thailand um mm-hmm. there and then another thing you need to get there's jade noodles which is a uh, an egg noodle that's been made with um mustard greens so you, when you when you juice the mustard greens you put it into the um the egg uh flour pasta they're actually green noodles that's why they're called mm. jade noodles <laughs> and then they're they're served uh blanched with with what I call kind of the uh, the pizza version, you know, when you get the pizza with every kind of meat, um, right? This right. is the this is the noodle dish with every kind of meat because it's got duck, it's got pork, it's got beef balls, it's got um, you know cracklings in it. Uh, so again, I could go on all day, man, but uh, these are just <laughs> yeah. a, a sample of what you can get. At the noodle place is it the kind of place that people would like? grab a bowl and take out or is it something that they would kind of like you know have an espresso like you're in italy and you're just going to do your quick coffee and then run to the rest of your day no you nailed that it's kind of both man i think for the person who's uh needs a quick lunch um instead of your italian espresso they do make the best thai coffee in uh and around la um so most thai coffee is made from a mix and Thai coffee is basically a, a very dark roasted, almost like an espresso roast bean. Um, and then they roast uh, tamarind seeds. They add a lot of sugar in it. Um, and you basically serve it cold over ice with a good amount of half and half. So it's it's this very creamy, um, sweet coffee. Not as strong as Vietnamese coffee. I think more aromatic and rounded. Um, but but Sap Cafe has the best drink. So they make uh, the Thai coffee, the Thai tea from scratch. They also have like very special juices like sugarcane, fresh sugarcane juice, long gin juice. But you definitely, yeah, you want to either grab a bowl of noodles or, or a plate of rice with, you know, either like duck or um, uh, a, like a spicy basil stir fry. But the hack, and here's the trick. If you know you're going to be eating like crazy in Thai town or through L.A., Drive by yeah, um, Sap on the way home mm-hmm. and get some jade noodles to go, oh, and then idea. that'll be your dinner or your your meal the next day because that that's <laughs> that's the key move right there. 
Right. You're kind of extending your visit by taking home <laughs> some great food. That's amazing. That, that's exactly right. <laughs> so like, you know, for somebody who, who maybe just has like an afternoon, like what would you say is like one signature dish that you, you just have to have? So if you had just an afternoon, I would definitely do sap and do um, like a, a beverage. So either their Thai tea, Thai coffee, and either the jade noodles or their, they also have, um, for a rice dish, I would do like the the barbecue trio over rice. There's a rich culture of Chinese, Southern Chinese people that have uh, lived in Thailand for a long time. So it's the Thai version of like red roasted pork and sausage and duck. Um, or I would head, if you're going to do New Hollywood Plaza, we've already talked about the, um, the papaya salad. There's also a... Um, uh, grab the coconut fritters from the dessert shop and um, right next to the dessert shop, there's a restaurant called Pa Ord, which means anti um, Ord and hmm. get their Tom Yum noodles. They're, we all know Tom Yum soup is that hot, sour, um, spicy soup, but mm -hmm. their version of Tom Yum broth in noodles with ground pork and meatballs is outstanding. So in an afternoon, you've got about four options right there, but you have to grab some coconut fritters um, also to go from the dessert shop on the way out. Wow, that sounds amazing. <laughs> uh, are there are there any like memories that you can share from that time you had, you know, filming that episode with Anthony Bourdain that that didn't make it into the episode, but you still think, you know, you back you think back on it very fondly? Yeah, you know, what really struck me about working with Tony was, you know, I've done a lot of TV. I've probably done over 100 episodes of Food Network shows by now. And, you know, there, there's a decent amount of prep that most human beings would need. Like, you know, um, and you, you've you been in media for years. You know, we, we want to know kind of where we're starting, what points to hit, where we want to get to. And, and that gives you kind of a rough idea of, of what the segment's going to be. But Tony, what I remember... Um, I think they were setting up a shot where he was walking and I think um, one of the producers wanted to do like a little super eight shot to weave in kind of like this old timey um, move. Mm -hmm. And um, so he was supposed to do this walk up to me and then we were supposed to like, you know, maybe I thought we'd reset and do it again, but he walks up, he does this beautiful walk, you know, and then he, and then we just, he just starts talking and, and, and just his ability to, to kind of narrate and absorb kind of the culture that was going around him within minutes and, and, and articulate the feelings, the smells, the, the, the man, just all those kind of sense memories of a place and then pull stories out of like me and, and the people around the, the, that's what I'm going to remember about, about Tony and, and, you know, I can, <laughs> you know, I remember the, the smells of the restaurants, you know, the coffee brewing in the morning. I remember the garlic, garlic smell that the, that the HVAC pulls out of the restaurants. And, <laughs> and then I, and I remember, you know, uh, I just, I remember the faint smell of cigarettes. <laughs> hanging out with me. And, and, uh, that really, that really would be a, a deep memory that, that I'll never forget. Wow. That's really cool. You know, you, you mentioned that Thai town is like surrounded by these other really fascinating communities and, uh, and culinary destinations. Can you give us a quick overview? Yeah, for sure. Um, so Sunset Boulevard, I mean, Hollywood Boulevard on the north side is Thai town on the south side is little Armenia. Um, and you know, uh, I, gr I grew up with, um, obviously next to little Armenia, don't know a lot about the culture, but walking, uh, S S uh Hollywood Boulevard, you know, um, between Western and Normandy, uh, on the South side of the street, you're going to find Armenian bakeries. Um, you're going to find just a, a beautiful amount of, um, you know, uh, uh, I think Armenian specialties don't know them well, but then you walk a few blocks and then you're going to get a Salvadorian pupusas. <laughs> so, um, well, <laughs> and then you're going to find a, a really solid Mexican taco. And then, but th that is the beauty right now of, of, of walking that strip of, of kind of East Hollywood. That's right. So, so is that all on basically one street? Like, if there was a a block or a neighborhood that you'd like to take people to to kind of impress them about, like the diversity and the quality of the culinary scene there, is that the block that you would take them to? For sure. So, um, the best thing again, go to. Uh, I would start at New Hollywood Plaza, park your car there, right, uh, and and then from there you can walk one block 
east uh, and go to Sap Coffee Shop, right? You can take, um, you can cross the street south, and now you're immediately in Little Armenia um, and and hit a bakery, uh, walk west, and then uh, you can actually hit Harvard and Stone, which is a, a really great little uh, local bar. But you know, within within four or five blocks, there's the metro as well. Um, and then going the other way, there's some really great Salvadorian food. So again, just start start there at Hollywood, uh, where Harvard kind of, uh, or Hobart runs into um, Hollywood, and you're good to go. Mm, you know, that, that sounds fantastic. I mean, and you know, I know we've been focusing on East LA during this conversation. Is there another part of the county that you like to hit, maybe just to mix things up? Uh, you know, yeah, I, I grew up kind of all over the city. San Gabriel Valley is is kind of a can't you can't you know uh, not hit it if you're coming to LA and you want to get a, a little bit of kind of a, a culinary uh, feel. So the San Gabriel Valley uh, for Vietnamese and Chinese food without having to go all the way uh, to Orange County. Um, and you know, man, I mean, we we could we could just keep going. I mean, it's so deep here, you know, <laughs> right. in Little Tokyo, you know. But uh, but again, these are the the places that 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 I grew up in in this in this amazing city. That's really great. Um, when it comes to like family friendly spots, are there any that, you know, you love to explore in Los Angeles? Yeah. You know, uh, my wife and I, we have two little ones. So, you know, we're, we're, they're nine and they're six. Um, so there's, there's, you can, I would, I would check out Griffith park if you're going to be on the East side, you know, mm -hmm. if you need to work off, uh, that, <laughs> uh, you know, the meat sweats or, or that, that gut bomb. I mean, uh, drive North on, on, on sunset till it turns, uh, actually Western and turns into Los Feliz. And then, and then you drive, either drive by the Griffith observatory or find, um, a place in Griffith park to kind of just walk around and explore the city in terms of family friendly. Um, that also will get you obviously into kind of that Atwater Glendale area, um, but you know what, I think we're, if you look hard enough, I think it's tough when you're coming from out of town to, um, cause you don't really see the parks as you're driving by, but if you're looking for them, um, there, there, there's a lot of family places that, that you can explore. Yeah. And Griffith park is great. Cause you also get those great views. You can hike, you can, there's so much to do there. Oh yeah. And you know, the, 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 the horse, the horsey rides are there. You could actually, uh, more on the North side of the park, you can rent a horse for one to four hours and ride it around. And, 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 and then you're, you're also close to echo park and, you know, and I would, I think it's worth kind of driving through if you're going to do the East side, um, you know, <laughs> then we open up Glendale and then we open up Eagle rock, dude, it can go deep. It can go deep. Yeah. I, absolutely. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Now I understand that you're there that you're part of a partnership with Visit California and the family focused brand camp. Uh, what can you tell us about that? If anyone happens to be in NYC between you know March and the end of April, you've got to check out my favorite family experience at the camp store on Fifth Avenue. So so they're doing this really fun partnership with Visit California, and they've built the ultimate experience for kids and their families featuring all the best parts of California. And, and, and one lucky family who stops by could win a free trip back here. I know we're talking in Cali, but if you're listening from New York and you want to win a free trip this way, um, this is a great opportunity. And I'm really super stoked about their LA location opening this spring. Oh, that's so great. Well, Jet, this has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on California Now. Man, I, I can't thank you enough, brother. Um, th uh, thanks for having me. So honored to be kind of, you know, speaking on this great state and the city that, that, you know, I was born and bred in. Jet Tila is a Los Angeles chef and culinary storyteller on TV. His website is chefjet.com, and he's on Twitter and Instagram at Jet Tila. We'll have more about how to hack Los Angeles in just a moment. This is California Now. If you enjoyed my conversation with Jet Tila just now, you'll find many more like it in our archives. I've interviewed all sorts of culinary luminaries on California Now, ranging from celebrated chefs like Curtis Stone and Claudette Zepeda to foodie insiders like Troy Johnson and Jeff gordon -Ear. The best way to access these episodes and many more is to subscribe. You'll gain access to our entire back catalog so you can pick and choose the material that interests you most. Plus, new episodes will be delivered straight to you as soon as they go live. Just go to your favorite podcast platform and subscribe to the California Now podcast. Thanks.
Los Angeles County is a big place. My next guest has lived there for decades and says she's still exploring new parts of it. Mary Ford Joan writes the Los Angeles Times newsletter, The Wild, and she's here to share some of the -the off-the-beaten-path ideas for surprising outdoor places to visit and new ways to experience the familiar in and around L.A. Welcome to California Now, Mary. Hi, thank you. So let's introduce your newsletter, The Wild, just briefly. What does it, you know, cover? Oh, my God, I just love this. Um, (laughs) It is, we really are the only newspaper I know of doing this kind of coverage. So it's everything in the outdoors in Southern California. And that can be gardening. It can be going to a 10,000-foot peak. It can be running the LA Marathon. It can be swimming. It can be triathletes. And the whole point of it is to, I think one of the best hidden secrets about the LA area is that it's a great outdoor playground. Most people don't come for that. It is a fabulous place to hike, to swim, to compete, to run, to trail run. So um, that's what this newsletter is about. My personal like guiding light on the newsletter is, I just want to get people off their couches (laughs) and into somewhere out in the urban or even farther nature. Yeah, no, it's really great. And especially because the weather in L.A. is almost always so great that why not take advantage of of being outside? Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's the reason (laughs) why I live here. I am an East Coast transplant, been here four decades. And my biggest claim to fame about L.A. and why I think it is my personal paradise is I can be outdoors 24-7, I can hike, I can do all the kinds of things that I like to do, and, um, you know, those aren't clearly um, offered everywhere in the world. So L.A. has that just, I mean, Southern California has that great sweet spot. Absolutely. The weather, the terrain beautiful landscaping. You got the ocean, you got the mountains. Oh my God, I could go on forever. Yeah, no. Well, so let's get to some places folks can visit. I mean, in the intro, I mentioned seeing familiar places in new ways. Um, What's an outdoor example that comes to mind? Okay. So one of our places, Griffith Park, this is like, I, I consider it my personal gym. It is, I guess, equivalent to Central Park in New York, but it, it's kind of, I call it LA's wild heart. It's a <laughs> huge, massive park. It is so different from Central Park in that you can see coyotes, you can see owls, you can see all kinds of things. We have a very famous mountain lion, which I have never seen, <laughs> named P-22. And there is just a marvelous photo of uh, that mountain lion with the Hollywood sign in the background. Oh my God, what can be more wild LA (laughs) than that? (laughs) But one of the things I often take visitors to or or locals to, um, because it's a little known, is uh, LA, Griffith Park, is a great place to night hike. Hmm. So you start, particularly in winter, five, six o'clock, summer, maybe a little later, um, and you take off on these trails. And the best part is two of the most common destinations, a little point called Mount Hollywood, which is not where the Hollywood sign is, or (laughs) Mount Lee, which is where the Hollywood sign is. So you can hike up at night. And the most wonderful thing is you are standing a couple thousand feet above LA and you are looking out at this just amazing lighted up megalopolis. And it is breathtaking. Just like a sheet of diamonds shimmering off into the distance. it's it's fantastic. You can pick out downtown. You can pick out Dodger Stadium. Now you can see SoFi Stadium. Uh, it And it's just, you know, it's the thrill people get, I guess, when you go to the Empire State Building at night or something like that, except you got this great workout. You hiked about two and a half, three miles uphill to get this beautiful views. Right. That's amazing. And so, like, you know, if you're doing a night hike, is it the kind of thing that you can kind of incorporate hitting the observatory at maybe at the end of your hike and maybe, you know, experience some of that? Absolutely. In fact, you can even start your hike at the observatory. The observatory is so great. Um, It has reopened. It's only open certain days, but at any rate, it is the kind of place where you want to be inside and out. They do have stargazing nights and then indoors, you know, it has all the um, displays and whatnot about the heavens and it's free, which is also a big plus. Right. That's great. Uh, so so what's a good way, you know, to try that out for someone who's visiting from out okay. of town or, or just new to Griffith Park? If you're going to night hike, you really don't, you can do this during the day and they are beautiful hikes. But if you really want to get that extra kind of insider night hiking, you really want to go with a group. You can generally find a night hiking LA group on Meetup 
or more reliably, the local Sierra Club chapter leads free hikes 7 p.m. Tuesdays and Thursdays from something called the merry-go-round parking lot. Mm -hmm. So if people want to Google Angeles chapter Sierra Club, they will find that hike listed, how to get there, and you just show up. And the nice part about those hikes is um, they have different levels. So they have beginner to more advanced. So that's great. You go with a group, you won't get lost, and you'll get those great views. Yeah, sounds amazing. What's another spot you recommend to hikers? Uh, Other spots that I recommend absolutely would be, and on the easier side, would be beach walks and cliff bluff walks or cliff walks. So beach walks, we all love to walk on the beach, right? Santa Monica, Malibu, you can just go for miles and miles and miles. No, don't walk on the bike path because people are going very fast. (laughs) Do walk along the sand, plus your feet, your feet kind of like that. It's good for your feet to spread out. At any rate, beach walks are great. But I also really like bluff walks because you get these, that's where you're getting the wonderful views of the beach below. So a couple of places I like to go on the Palos Verdes Peninsula, there's a seascape trail that, again, pretty easy to find if you Google. And it just takes you along, you know, you're looking down on these wonderful cliffy, uh, cliffy formations. And I got to tell you, it starts looking a little more like Northern California than Southern California in some of these spots. Uh, Santa Monica also has a really, really nice bluff side trail, very, you know, right from the pier, you can just start walking. And then one of my other favorites, and these are easy hikes, mile, mile and a half, is the Point Doom State Beach Trail in Malibu. And that is just lovely. You get the views from the top and then you can head down to the beach. Oh, that sounds amazing. Now, I, I understand there's a, there's another spot kind of just outside of L.A. County um, that you love to recommend as well, which is Mount Baldy. Tell us about that. I love Mount Baldy, and it is just inside um, L.A. County, so it's the highest point in L.A. County. Oh, it is? Okay. Um, it is officially called Mount San Antonio. I love this peak because I like high-altitude hiking, and I love that within an hour's drive, I can get up and, you know, be in that like moonscape, treeless kind of environment. <laughs> You're kind know, of like above just, the tree line, right? So there's like not, not absolute, much growing up there. Absolutely. There is nothing up there. It looks like the moon. And as a result, you get these wonderful 360 degree views. You're looking down at the desert on one side. And on the other side, you're looking down at the environs of LA, like the Claremont uh, area. At any rate, it is a 10,000 plus foot peak. Mm. So when you're up there, you know, some people get a little dizzy, some people get a little headachy. It is high elevation. Um, for about, it is a very strenuous hike for those people who really want to test themselves. But 10 miles with like 4,000 feet of gain, there are various ways you can do it. But if you want to go the cheater route, you can take a chairlift up to about the 7,800, 8,000 foot level and start hiking from there. And then it's 3.5 miles to the top. Now it's still a hard uphill haul, right? but um, so rewarding, so fantastic. Again, I consider it one of my like outdoor gym workout places that I go to get in shape for just about anything. Yeah. And it sounds like a really great day trip for Angelinos. Exactly. Now, right now they have skiing because it is also a ski resort in winter, very small, but it's in the San Gabriel Mountains uh, in the Angeles National Forest. And boy, if you're here in summer and you want to beat the heat and get up to 10,000 feet and say you accomplish something, (laughs) you want to go to Mount Baldy. Right, right. So especially so for the hiking, you really want to do it uh, the best time of year is what? Summertime. Summertime for these high peaks, summertime for beach walks and cliff walks and uh, other walks in the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, any time of the year is fine. Right, right, right. So so as far as beaches go, are, 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 is there anywhere else that you like to send people to appreciate the ocean? Um, there are so many places, yeah. right? <laughs> L.A. Imagine. is so great. Um, one of the places I just wrote about this in the wild, it is just this weird little phenom that started mm, right around 2008, or at least we all started noticing sea turtles, green sea turtles, who, which are born in like sandy beaches in central Mexico are starting to discover LA, just like the rest (laughs) of us who moved here. (laughs) So they, you know, they started coming up right around 2008. Um, Marine biologists kind of documented a bunch of them 
at very near the end of the San Gabriel River in Long Beach area, in like this little bay called Alamitos Bay. And they've stayed ever since. So anybody who wants to walk or bike on the San Gabriel uh, bike path, and you'll find that on Google Maps, to the end of it at Long Beach, you can go look down and see these like grapefruit size heads popping <laughs> up out of the water and you'll see these sea turtles. Um, they really like the shallows. They're turning up in Marina del Rey, in San Diego area. And I was just talking to some biologists who said, you know, we've cleaned up our shallows so much that there are seagrasses and kelp and things they like to feed on. Um, so they come, they forage, and now they stay. That's so pretty amazing. I find that just really, you know, <laughs> really, really interesting. So for kind of a different thing, go go looking for sea turtles outside of an aquarium. Right, right. I mean, when people think of L.A., I don't think they think about, you know, going out to, to look for sea turtles. Yeah, yeah. So it's <laughs> one of those little quirky things. Yeah, and I, I guess, you know, when people go out to do that, they, they really should, you know, keep a respectful distance out of consideration for the turtles, right? Always, always. Right. What What about tide pooling? Where Where, where are good places to experience oh, that? Oh, tide pooling. Tide pooling is one of those things. I mean, it's the thing that I discovered when I came to Southern California. I know they do it in Northern California and other areas as well. But for me, it was just a, a real eye opener. Um, you know, you go out at low tide. San Pedro is a good spot, which is at the southernmost tip of the city of Los Angeles, places on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. And um, you literally go out in low tide and it's just these little pools, you know, little rock pools or something, you know, the beach is not perfectly flat. And you look in and at first you think, okay, I don't see anything going on here. This is so boring. Why did I come? <laughs> and then uh, you start seeing like air bubbles and you start seeing, oh my God, is that a sea star? You know, oh my God, is that a sea hare? And you just see all these little critters um, down in San Pedro, uh, we have the Cabrillo Aquarium and Museum, and we have the um, Pacific Aquarium over in Long Beach. And you can learn all the little critters that you'll see in the tide pools. But for the most part, you know, little snails, limpets, and it's just kind of fun. And you kind of watch them move around and whatnot. And then high tide comes and shows over until the next low tide. <laughs> that sounds great. Now, I know, I know your specialty is outdoor experiences, but you do have to go indoors every once in a while, right? So uh, let's talk about some of your favorite cultural touchstones. What, what comes to mind? I always feel like there are landmarks in L.A. that are so overlooked. One of my favorites uh, is the, the, we have uh, Frank Lloyd Wright House. It mm -hmm. was his first L.A. Uh, home that he designed, and it's called the Hollyhock House. And I love this place. It is wildly overlooked, and it is never crowded. It is on a hill in Hollywood. It's very easy to find. And um, he built this house for a woman named Aileen Barnsdall. She was like this gas, uh, I think, gas and oil heiress. At any rate, she wanted, she envisioned having an art colony on this hill in Hollywood. So she got Frank Lloyd Wright to design her home. And then she envisioned having outbuildings uh, where artists would come and it would just be this very cultural, culturally rich place. Well, Frank Lloyd Wright built the house. Um, he was not, he didn't really care about Southern California's weather so much. Mm. So I think it was a bit leaky. Oh, <laughs> um, but it is just stunning. It was built between 1919 and 1921. So when you enter it, you still have it still feels so modern in 2022. It has a sunken living room. It has just lovely indoor outdoor uh, places where you are always seeing natural light. One of my favorite little details is that the walls are just slightly tilted. Because he didn't want anybody hanging paintings. Oh, this funny. was going to be, he was going to design it, but he would put the furniture in and that's it. That's the way it was going to look. Oh, that's the, funny. the sunken living room with the fireplace is just absolutely dreamy. And this house underwent an enormous renovation, I want to say three or four years ago. So it is really in tip top shape. It has reopened. So you can go uh, take a tour. And it is LA's, I think in a couple of years ago, 2019, 
It's LA's first UNESCO World Heritage Site. Oh, cool. I would, I dare say hardly any Angelinos know that, but I appreciate <laughs> it. And um, I appreciate this house. And the, ho- and the house is basically set up the way he designed it with the furniture he designed Correct. and everything else. That's pretty amazing. That is exactly right. That wow. is exactly that right. Is so- and just as a footnote, apparently Aileen Barnstall did not spend a lot of time there. She didn't like the house. She <laughs> thought it was too cold. So we get to enjoy it, even oh, if that, she didn't. That is so cool. Are there any other architectural stops you, you like to recommend? Yeah. And this one also is related to Frank Lloyd Wright. So down on the Palos Verdes Peninsula, which is in the what we call the South Bay of LA, um, there is a place called the Wayfarer's Chapel, which I just think is adorable. It was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright's son, Lloyd Wright. I think it was, des- uh, I think they finished it in 1951. At any rate, it is again up on a hill. So you get fantastic ocean views. And it is a very small glassed-in chapel. And he designed it. I'm, I'm not sure. Redwoods were never native to the Palos Verdes Peninsula, but he did plant redwoods, and they're there. He <laughs> planted redwoods to frame it on the outside so it is completely glass. When you uh, look to the front of the church, you uh, just see the hillside. It is absolutely stunning. It is so popular for weddings. And it's just a beautiful place. Anybody can stop, pull off, and enjoy it. And it was built by the followers of Emanuel Swedenborg. I had knew very little about Swedenborgians and their views, their religion, uh, but they are the ones who maintain it. Again, it's free and open to all. All right, so let's hit one more sort of unexplored corner of L.A. County um, and may, maybe make a day of it. Like, where are we going and, and where do we start? Oh, it's my adopted hometown of San Pedro. (laughs) I have to take you there. I would start out, San Pedro is a fantastic breakfast place. Mm. We have, I'm just going to mention a few, Rex's Cafe, Omelette and Waffle, Pacific Diner. And these are, these, this is not your, you know, champagne and eggs benedict kind of place. These are awesome, uh, very classic diner style food. And some of them are a little healthier than others. But what's so great about having breakfast in Pedro is these are places where you just hang out. Breakfast takes a while. You, you, you're sitting, you're talking, you're enjoying, you're getting the endless cups of coffee. Mm. Nobody's in a rush. That's so great. I say do a big, goopy, lazy breakfast to start your day in Pedro. <laughs> so, so like, what do you love to order? Oh, what I love to order, so I'm vegetarian, so I lean towards Rex's Cafe. They have whole wheat blueberry pancakes, and people always make this mistake. They're like, oh, I don't know if I should have two or three. (laughs) They come out, they are as big as the 12-inch plates they are served (laughs) on. It is insane. And (laughs) most people go, oh, my God, you know, you got three, you can barely get through one. So I love whole wheat blueberry pancakes. Uh, They are also a restaurant where you can get um, like tofu scrambler and things like that if you want the healthier. So that's that's kind of my go-to place. Yeah. And for your meat eater friends, what do they like to order? Oh, I think Pacific Diner is the place when you want to get, you know, bacon and eggs, sausage and eggs, also omelet and waffle shop. Um, When you want just that really classic breakfast, maybe some French toast on the side Mm -hmm. where you're just going to, you know, bulk up on the carbs before the rest of your tour. Right. That sounds, that all sounds really great. Okay. So now we've all, we've loaded up on breakfast. Uh, Where where are you taking me next? Oh, I really like, I mentioned it before, the Cabrillo Aquarium. Uh, It is not a big aquarium. And for that, I kind of like it. You don't have to spend the entire day, a couple of hours, and you kind of get the basics. What I like about the aquarium is you go through it and you'll see a lot of what exists in tidal Southern California. So, you know, you'll see all your little tiger sharks and things like that. And it's just really nicely laid out. Um, as, now that I think of it, Frank Geary designed the building. Oh. Um, again, it's it's small enough that you can do in a few hours. And outside of it, this is kind of a new thing, are some fantastic new murals of San Pedro made by John Van Hammersveld. He's the guy who designed the Endless Summer movie poster and just a fantastic graphic artist. And I think these went up in the last couple of years. They're like those big canvas murals. And oh my goodness, if you want to do Instas, 
you have to stand in front of the murals. <laughs> I also highly recommend um, a stop at the gift shop. It is one of the most inspired museum gift shops. Um, I got koi fish Christmas tree ornaments. There. Oh, wow. <laughs> and they have all kinds of marine stuff, very innovative and whatnot. So I would definitely go to the Carrillo Museum. And then you're just going to walk out and kind of walk around Cabrillo Beach. If you're there during low tide, you're lucky enough there are tide pools there. Wow. You can just kind of walk around the beach uh, and kind of see, you'll see a bit of the port and you'll see kind of how that whole world operates. But you'll also have the outer beach, which um, you can go swimming if you want. You can do right. all of that. Right. Okay. So uh, before we go to lunch, where else should we hit? Okay, you got to go up, and it's very close to where you know to that to the aquarium. Got to go up to the Korean Bell, which is on a hill. This was a gift, I think, in America's bicentennial, nineteen seventy six, uh, from Korea, and it is adorable. It's a replica of like a pagoda style with a bell in the middle. Hmm. Um, it stands on the hill. It's just one of those very beautiful landmarks, and it happens to be a fantastic kite flying spot. So wow. you will see people there with kites of all types. You will have fantastic views of the ocean and the Palos Verdes Peninsula. And uh, on the side of it, there is what's got to be the most beautiful basketball courts in Los Angeles City <laughs> is a basketball court. So you're playing basketball and you're overlooking the ocean. Doesn't, oh, wow. doesn't get better than that. <laughs> That's amazing. Very LA. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's funny. Okay, so where are we where are we heading for lunch? Okay, I'm going to recommend two places. Even as a vegetarian, these it's not my type of food, but I take people there because they love it. San Pedro Fish Market, hands down, it is. I don't know why, but it's the most Instagram one of the most Instagram restaurants in America. <laughs> um, it is just that. It is an old style like fish market, and you know, ready made you know fish, clams, and shrimp, and everything you could want. It is on the water in what is called the old ports of call, which is being rehabilitated. And we're all a bit unnerved because the San Pedro fish market is going to move because of the redevelopment in that area. But at any rate, it's a great place to go for lunch. It's, you know, easy dining. You know, you just walk up, you make your order, then you grab your basket and you're sitting, you know, on the waterfront. That sounds great. Okay, so where should I go to, you know, I want to sort of wind down for the day. Okay, I like to go to, uh, or where I take people to is um, Brewery West, and it has a very odd spelling, (laughs) B-R-O-U-W-E-R-I-J. I I pronounce it Brewery West, I'm not sure how they do. Uh, (laughs) They do handcrafted beers, hard seltzer, and it's just a great place. It's in an old warehouse that's been repurposed. And it's just got this laid back, sit outside or inside, if you like, uh, kind of vibe. There's always food trucks in the area or they may have a food demo going on. There's sometimes live music. And it's just kind of a great place to also to strike up a conversation with the locals, meet some of the locals, ask them what they do. Maybe you'll meet some longshoremen. Maybe you'll meet some... I've lived in Pedro all my life because San Pedro is this place where I swear there must be zero turnover. It must be the one part of L.A. People who are born and live here stay. That's so great. Mary, this has been a lot of fun and uh, so informative and helpful. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us on California Now. Oh, you are so kind. It's been great. Mary Forjone writes the weekly newsletter, The Wild, for the Los Angeles Times. You can sign up online by going to latimes.com slash the wild. This is California Now. Los Angeles is renowned as a global melting pot, and that certainly extends into the world of culinary delights. If you're looking to sample many of these amazing flavors in a single location, you're going to want to pay close attention to my next guest. Zach Brooks is general manager of Smorgasburg LA, a weekly gathering of some of the best bites in Los Angeles. This recurring, family-friendly food festival is a Sunday tradition for locals and quite possibly the best first stop on your next visit to the area. Welcome to California Now, Zach. Thanks for having me. So just to get a quick origin story, Smorgasburg LA is, is kind of like the West Coast descendant of the Brooklyn Flea. Am I getting that right? 
Yeah, yeah. So Smorgasburg was born out of the Brooklyn flea, which started probably 13 years ago now in Brooklyn um, by uh, Eric Denby and Jonathan Butler. And um, there was a little bit of food at the original Brooklyn flea, which was sort of like a hipster flea market kind of thing, which still exists in multiple locations in New York. And um, it had a little bit of food. And um, and then they ended up, the food became so popular that they ended up spinning it off into its own event called Smorgasburg, um, which at the time was sort of a combination of Smorgasbord right. and Williamsburg, which is where the first Smorgasburg happened. Right. And, and, and that was, so now the LA version of it is what, like five or six years uh, old now? Yeah, so we'll be celebrating. It'll be our it'll be our six year anniversary in June. That's really great. So, and I I, call, I called it a food festival in the intro. Did I get that right? Yeah, I mean it's I mean it is a collection of incredibly delicious food uh, that you can eat every single Sunday. So whatever you know, a lot of people call it a food festival, a market. Uh, you know, you can call it whatever you want. It's just a lot of deliciousness. <laughs> and so like how many food vendors do you typically have on a on a Sunday? Anywhere from like 60 to 70 food vendors. And then um, even though it's called Smorgasburg out here, it's actually a mix of food and shopping vendors. Mm-hmm. So we have a little bit of a flea as well. Um, so usually there's about 90 to 100 vendors in total when you add in the shopping vendors. For people who aren't familiar with L.A. geography, where does Smorgasburg take place? So yeah, we're in downtown at uh, Row DTLA, which is this fairly new development um, just outside the Arts District in um, what's kind of a historic area of downtown. Um, If you visited LA or you're familiar with downtown, you might know it as the place where the American Apparel Factory used to be. And there's also like this 100-year-old wholesale produce market that still operates today, Monday through Saturday. And they're closed on Sundays, so we actually set up in the lot where the wholesale produce market is um, inside of Row. Okay, so I, I know we can't do like a complete inventory of what's on offer, but what what's sort of the quick overview of places or, or cuisines represented at Smorgasburg? We are a pretty good representation, I feel like, of everything that L.A. has to offer food-wise. So there is every kind of cuisine you could possibly imagine, everything from fried chicken to lobster. We've got a vendor who sells roti from the, that's inspired by the street food of Trinidad and Tobago. We've got, you know, Chinese dumplings. We've got uh, you know, Filipino grilled chicken. We've got Indonesian food. I mean, there's 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 definitely something for everybody. Mm. What what's like uh, say one or two favorites that you always tell people that they have to check out? Oh, I I can't. Uh, that's like choosing, <laughs> that's like choosing your like asking a parent to choose their favorite child. Right, um, right. <laughs> I mean, I could I could tell you something amazing about every single vendor at Smorgasburg. Like we. We really pride ourselves on being an incubator for new food businesses. And so, you know, every one of our vendors is sort of, you know, not necessarily in like the beginning stages of their journey, although a lot of them are, um, mm-hmm. you know, we we really pride ourselves on sort of being that, that next step, you know, especially coming out of the pandemic where there were so many businesses that were like started inside people's houses, you know, where people were just making food and selling them or pivoting, you know, whatever business they had at the time, or they got laid off from their jobs and just decided to start a food business in their house, you know, and so we really, you know, coming out of something like that, we're really proud to be sort of a place where people that that vendors see as sort of the next stepping stone going from like, say, a pop up to a place like Smorgasburg, and then maybe eventually graduate to a brick and mortar business. Wow, that's really great. Um, so I, I mean, I know you can't really, you know, single out. A <laughs> but you're going to ask me to, you're gonna ask I, me to I, do it anyway. You're gonna... <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to ask you this. I'm going to ask you this. So what was the last thing you had at Smorgasburg and what was so great about it? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, well, I, I ate a bunch of things yesterday. Um, I had uh, I had churros from Churro Boss, which um, is this uh, this couple who owns uh, a, a churro stand that's based on it's a 
it's a former Marine who's, I think it was his grandfather um, had this churro recipe um, from a certain region of Mexico and he's passed it down through like multiple generations. And wow. his son, who's a retired Marine, started this business in LA uh, where they do these amazing churros from that old family recipe. And then they'll put like ice cream and Hershey syrup and, mm. and, and, you know, fruity pebbles and stuff on top of it. But, you know, for, for <laughs> Instagram, which is obviously a big thing at our market. Right. But what I love is that the churros themselves, you can get them plain and they're just incredible. Oh, that sounds great. And uh, the fact that it's like kind of this family recipe that was handed down from, ge you know, generation to generation, it yeah. uh, sounds like something like, you know, you probably wouldn't taste in another churro. Yeah. I mean, that's and that is why it's hard to pick favorites, because every one of our vendors like has a story like that. OK, so uh, you said you had several things yesterday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what um, else did you have? The other I had um, Bunkus Bagus, which is our brand new Indonesian vendor. Um, that was started during the pandemic. These two sisters um, who have family in Indonesia and they've spent a lot of time there um, and they do what's called a bunkus. It's basically like a, um, a bunch of different little Indonesian dishes with rice and a boiled egg and then they wrap it in this giant leaf and it mm. becomes this little triangular package of goodness that is mm -hmm. super, super delicious. And you can eat all the little things separately, or you can sort of mix it all together into this like delicious mash of rice and, you know, curry chicken and, um, you know, uh, tempeh, which is uh, sort of for anybody who's been to Southeast Asia is this amazing, um, uh, like sort of meat substitute that a lot of people eat in Southeast Asia. That's really delicious. Now, you know, you mentioned some some really cool stories of, of uh, you know, the kind of behind the scenes that, you know, the vendors have had. Are there any um, kind of like vendor stories that that really stand out to you that you're just like that just blew you away when you learned about them? One of my favorite stories coming out of the pandemic was this uh, a vendor called Uncle Terry's Kitchen. And um, they, you know, they applied to be at the market and, you know, to do catfish. And um, I went and I met with Uncle Terry and his whole family. And Terry is a uh, retired security guard who's never owned a food business, but he's been making catfish for over 20 years for his hmm. family and friends. And everybody tells him like, oh, my God, you got to start a business. You have to sell this catfish, the best catfish. And finally, his his uh, niece encouraged him to apply to Smorgasburg and like finally start the business, um, which he did. And it's funny, like, as you know, you know, like I said, at the beginning, like, we really pride ourselves on, on being a place where new business can, you know, new businesses can incubate. And, you know, but it's also funny, you know, we also see the flip side of it, which is how hard it is to run food businesses and how, you know, uh, just, it's just hard, you know, especially uh, coming out of the pandemic. And so there are so many stories of people, you know, the restaurant industry is lined with 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 failures from people who are like, my family told me I made the best version of this, you know, and and um, and then they started this business, they pour all their money into it. And it's just it's just really hard. It's tough. And so, you know, it was funny talking to Terry about all that and basically saying, man, you should enjoy your retirement and you should enjoy your family. And his daughter had just had a baby. And I was like, do you really want to be, you know? selling catfish every Sunday at Smorgasburg. And he was like, yeah, you know, this is like my dream. And it, his catfish, it really is the best catfish you've ever had. And so, <laughs> and he, every weekend he's there with his whole family, his daughter, their like newborn baby, like they're all there. It's like a big like family affair. And they're, you know, definitely, I don't want to say they're one of my favorite vendors because I don't, you know, want to play <laughs> favorites, but they're, <laughs> They're kind of one of my favorite vendors. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't tell I'm, anybody I said that. Right. Don't tell sure the, Don't tell yeah. everyone else. Right. I'm sure the other children will be okay with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you really you've created a space where you know the uh, the startup costs are very low, so you're almost like allowing, you know, us, you know, the public, 
uh, to have access to like these amazing family recipes, like you know, like like that, like that story right there. Like this guy makes amazing catfish, and maybe he, you know, he doesn't have money to start up a restaurant, but he can. He can do it at Smorgasburg and and everyone, the whole community kind of, uh, you know, uh, gains from that. Yeah. And that is that is definitely, you know, what we that's what we have, you know, strived to do from the very beginning, especially, you know, when we when when um, Smorgasburg opened in L.A., you know, as like, a, you know, the, the Smorgasburgs in New York are very popular. A lot of people have been to them. And there are a lot of like New York expats living in L.A. who are like, ah, I've already I've already been to, you know, and then they come to the LA one and they're, everyone's always surprised that it's not like we didn't, you know, pick up Smorgasburg in New York and drop it down in the middle of LA. Like it's not this New York thing that's come to, it is here in LA, it is an LA market, right? It is in New York. It's all these amazing businesses, small businesses from New York in LA. It is all businesses from LA. And, you know, we really feel like, you know, it, it's it's a really amazing representation of all the great things that are happening food wise in the city right now. Right, right. And to your point, so like if I were like a big taco enthusiast, could I go like absolutely crazy at at, at Smorgasburg, LA? Oh my, yeah. I think we have one of the best collections of tacos in the city, especially for someone who from out of town who wants to just go to one place and be able to experience like a bunch of different styles of taco, like every kind of taco that, you know, represented in LA. I mean, you can, you can come to Smorgasburg and start at Los Dorados, have an amazing flauta, and then sort of work your way across and get, you know, Tijuana style arrobada from Tacos 1986, and then get uh, carnitas from Los Cochinitos, and then get um, goat bidia from the goat mafia. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then end at Burritos La Palma, who does, um, you know, they're called burritos, but, you know, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a big debate about whether or not a, uh, a burrito can be considered a taco. And these are basically like the best flour tortillas that you can imagine wrapped around either bidia or just a very simple like bean and cheese mixture. Hmm. Um, they're, they are really popular uh, Zacateca style tacos, um, these like little mini burritos and they're super delicious. And, um, and then we have a few like, you know, sort of, um, amazing up and coming, you know, Mexican, Mexican American chefs doing like modern tacos, like their take on, and, and, you know, vendors like Machine and Evil Cooks who are doing, you know, some incredible things that you won't be able to find anywhere else. Well, that sounds amazing. I have a friend who, uh, you know, travels mostly California, but the world looking for like the best taco. But it sounds like she could do it all right there. Just like, you know, every Sunday, a couple of different tacos. I mean, I'm definitely biased. But yes, I think that is, <laughs> that is what the, what you said is definitely true. Uh, do you have any personal favorite dishes like, you know, that you just. Oh, my find God, you going? won't stop. You're like trying to get me in trouble. You want everyone. You're like literally want every uh, every person every vendor i work with to listen to this interview and then be mad at me for not mentioning them (laughs) okay how about this how about two weeks ago you had something what you have (laughs) you want you want me to go back to my you just want me to go through my instagram and tell you everything i've eaten right Uh, right exactly i have it's funny people will be like uh have have you have you tried everything and it's like (laughs) yeah yeah i have i've literally tried every single thing to the point where i actually started um you know before the pandemic, I started because I had eaten everything, you know, to entertain myself on Sundays, I started creating smorg hacks, where I would take one thing from one vendor to another vendor's booth, and then make like a mashup, you know, so once I took uh, grilled lobster from Lobster Domus, which is one of our oldest and most popular vendors, they do whole grilled lobsters with garlic noodles. And um, and then I went and got a bean and cheese burrito from Burrito Sa Palma and made like a lobster bean and cheese burrito, oh, wow. which I which I dubbed the Puerto Nuevo because in <laughs> Baja, there's a little town called Puerto Nuevo that specializes in uh, whole grilled lobsters. And then they serve them with flour tortillas, beans and cheese and salsas. And they're amazing. So I made like my own version on a Sunday, which, uh, 
yeah, that's this is oh my god, this is a you know just a little glimpse into my yeah. uh, into my <laughs> into my your... my work. I'm doing air quotes. I'm doing air quotes <laughs> like around that. But, oh my god, yeah. that's pretty. That's pretty amazing though. You kind of like made your own kind of customized fusion dish. I yeah. mean, I mean, did they kind of do that because like, well, you're the general manager, or like, did <laughs> I just go and do well, it myself? No, the... No, that one, I mean, the lobster damas one, anybody can do. You just buy the bean and cheese burrito and you buy the lobster and then you open, like I did it myself. I opened up the burrito, like picked the, you know, took the lobster and like put it into the burrito and then (laughs) re-rolled it. So yeah, no, I, I fully support, uh, I fully support Smorg Hacks. Um, That's so great. Yeah. Okay, Zach. So now I I want some, I need some practical advice. Uh, Do you have any pro tips for people who have never been to Smorgasburg, L.A.? And but they want to do it, but they you know they want to try to get the most out of their experience. Sure, I mean the you know I I feel like the biggest tip is kind of common sense, but maybe it's not. I don't know. But the more people you come with, the better. I mean that's definitely like divide and conquer is really the best way to do smorgasburg. Um, some of the most popular places do can you know can have lines and stuff, and so the best way to do it is you come with a bunch of people. Have one person go find a table, like, you know, sort of a place where you can make your, you know, your home base. And then everybody have everybody get online in a different place and get one thing. And then you meet back at the table and share everything. That is that's definitely definitely the way to do it if you can. Yeah, no, that sounds like a great plan. And so, like, as far as beer goes, is 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 that only allowed in certain areas, or, or how does that work? Yeah, we have a pretty, you know, most of our seating is actually in a really large beer garden that we have on site. It's it's family friendly. You're allowed to like go in with kids and stuff. And we're actually super proud of our beer garden. It's run by uh, Fernando Lopez, whose family owns Gelaguetza, which is one of the most uh, well known Oaxacan restaurants in Los Angeles. It's been around for I think almost 30 years at this point. And um, Fernando's parents opened it. And then maybe like five or six years ago, they uh, retired and moved back to Oaxaca and gave the business to him and his three sisters who now run it. And then Fernando also started a business called I Love Micheladas, which took the Gilagetza Michelada recipe. um, And uh, you can now buy it like in bottles. And that is like the signature drink of our beer garden, which people can get every Sunday. That sounds really amazing. And, and you know, for people who uh, who need to kind of drive to get to you, what's the parking situation like? Oh, we have a, it's, it's funny. We, we have a giant parking lot, like huge, and it's actually free for two hours. It's a 4,000 car parking lot at Road DTLA. Wow. Um, and it's <laughs> funny when we first opened and I did some like radio interviews like this, I couldn't stop talking about the parking. Like I went on like, <laughs> I went on like food radio shows and I was like, but did I, did I mention how much parking there is? Because I feel like I felt when we when we first opened, it was just like it's such a it's such a uh, I don't know like a it's like a unique uh, thing to have as much parking as we do and have it be so easy at row and, and for it to so be free. I, uh, yes, I uh, I love talking about our parking. It's very, <laughs> very exciting. <laughs> well, Zach, this has been really great. Thank you so much for joining us on California Now. No, thanks for having me. Zach Brooks is general manager at Smorgasburg LA. They're online at la.smorgasburg.com and on Instagram at Smorgasburg LA. As always, we'll have links to all the places we talked about on today's episode and lots more on our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. Thank you for listening to California Now. We hope you enjoyed this episode and get a chance to hit the road soon. This podcast is produced by Visit California. I'm your host, Satirius Johnson. You can find our show on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please subscribe. And one last thing, if you haven't seen Visit California's new TV commercial, which features actor Anthony Anderson, TV host Mario Lopez, and San Francisco Giants shortstop Brandon Crawford, you can check it out at visitcalifornia.com. And if you have seen it but want to learn more about the making of the spot and the destinations featured in it, that information is available too. Just head on over to visitcalifornia.com. You can't miss it.